Om Namah Shivaya Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namaste So today I want to begin a conversation about yoga and consciousness. Now, if any of you have, you know, the typical Western background in yoga, you're going to say, well, what does yoga have to do with consciousness? Your view of yoga is only partial and very unbalanced and incomplete. And this is going to be the first thing we address in this uh, video. But beyond that, yoga is supposed to have eight steps. Ashtanga, eight limbs, or different topics or subjects under the heading of yoga. So the first two, yama and niyama, are rules and regulations, what to do and what not to do. Then there's asana. But actually, in the Yoga Sutras, only five asanas are mentioned, and they're all sitting asanas. Then comes pranayama, regulation of the breath for different purposes. And then, those are only the first four mundane levels. Then there's pratyahara, withdrawal of the mind from the senses. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never encountered a yoga teacher, even in India, that teaches pratyahara. See, <laughs> it's not part of the curriculum. I think modern people are very uh, unfavorable towards the very idea of pratyahara because they are obsessively extroverted and the idea of withdrawing the senses from their objects seems completely counterintuitive. So, right there, they go off the actual path of yoga. But wait, there's more. <laughs> After pratyahara, there's dharana. Dharana means concentration. Concentrating the mind on one thought. Then... Dhyana, meditation, and finally, samadhi. So actual yoga means samadhi. That's the aim, that's the objective, that's the highest level. That's what your target should be from the beginning. Why don't people teach this? Because they don't practice it. They weren't taught it by their teachers. They don't know anything about it. It's foreign territory. It's like not part of their experience. So we're going to look into the original teaching of yoga by Patanjali, sage Patanjali. The Patanjali Yoga Sutras are famous. And every yoga teacher worth the name pledges that their teaching comes direct <laughs> from Patanjali. But when we look at Patanjali's teaching... What do we see? The first sutra, as is common in Vedic works, expresses the intention, the purpose of the work. Atta yoga nushasanam. Now, the explanation of yoga. So this word atta has a special meaning. The Vedanta sutras also begin with atta, and Shankaracharya has given a detailed commentary on it, which you can learn about by watching this video. But in summary, it means that atta means now, after you have mastered so many other teachings, the fundamentals, now it's time to discuss Brahman. Atta, Brahma, Jignasa. Jignasa actually means like investigate. Not only discuss, but experience, practice. What are those practices? 
<laughs> That's what's given in the second sutra of Patanjali. Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is cessation of modifications of the mind stuff. This is what yoga is. Now, what is very interesting about this definition? Chitta vritti nirodaha. Chitta means mind stuff. And basically, it's a catch-all phrase for the internal organ, antakarana, which includes everything from mind, memory, visualization, imagination, thinking, logic, language, so many things, so many mental functions, intelligence even, uh, even consciousness. Well, let's take a look at this. First of all, nirodaha. Nirodaha means restraint, check, control, suppression, destruction, disappointment, frustration of hope, and even aversion, distaste, dislike. Aversion, destruction, distaste, dislike? For what? Chittam means mind stuff, including awareness, consciousness, attention, desire, intellect, will, intention, memory, imagination, and reason. And it's a catch-all summary phrase for the antakarana. So, chitta vritti means modification of the chittam. Modification means it has an original state, and then that state is changed. How is it changed? Well, we'll get into that in a little bit. But the point is that it is changed. Patanjali is advising his students to completely stop, completely restrain, destroy, develop a distaste and aversion to modifications of the mind. So is Patanjali the only one who's talking like this? Is he, you know, supported by Vedas anywhere? Well, to understand this, you have to understand the practice. You have to actually do the practice and get the results and the skills that lead to those results. And so what he's giving here is actually a direction for practice, a direction for meditation. Chitta vritti nirodaha, stop the modifications of the mind. Restore the mind to its original state. This is also echoed in the Upanishads by the teaching of Turiya. Turiya is that state of consciousness in which there are no upadis, no limiting adjuncts, such as the desire or uh, view that I am an individual, that I am a body, I am a mind, I am a doer, a knower, I am responsible for things, I am cause over things, and so on and so on. All these are upadis. They are limiting adjuncts, <clears throat> limiting the underlying substrate of Brahman, or Turiya consciousness. So we all have this Turiya consciousness, and we also all have these limiting adjuncts, upadis, so Shankaracharya is in agreement with this, and also the Buddha. Well, this is not widely known, even among Buddhists, but take a look at the shloka that the Buddha composed immediately after his enlightenment. Etang shantang, etang panitang, yadidang sabha sakkara samato, Sab upadi pati nisago, Tanakayo virago nirodo nibbanam. This is peaceful. This is excellent. Namely, the stilling of all fabrications, the relinquishment of all limiting adjuncts, the destruction of craving, detachment, nirvana. So this wonderful, wonderful shloka in Pali language, which is a kind of like um, 
colloquial or slang version of Sanskrit, and it was the uh, language of the people at the time of the Buddha. So he's using some Sanskrit words here, shanti, etang shantam, this is peaceful, shanti, 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 etam panitam, this is excellent, like this is really good. <laughs> Yadi dung, this thing, huh? namely, sabha sankara samato, now, sankara are like mental intentions, seeds of thoughts and actions, conceptions of identity, and so on. Fabrications. The fabrications of the mind. This is one kind of modification of the mind. So when all these fabrications are given up, then what? Sabupadi patinisago. The relinquishment of all limiting adjuncts, upadis. So we're going to talk about upadis in a little bit. But anyway, one should give them up. And this is exactly the same concept as given by Shankara in his commentary on Mandukya Upanishad and Vedanta Sutra and others. So there is complete agreement among Shankaracharya, Vedanta, Advaita, Yoga, Patanjali, and the Buddha. Well, after all, the Buddha appeared, I mean, still during the flowering of Vedic civilization, when everyone, especially of the three higher classes, the Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas, got training in their youth at the Gurukula, the house of the Guru. And they had to memorize many Sanskrit texts. And then when they got old enough, they were taught the meanings. So Buddha knows what he's talking about. He's studied the Upanishad, so many different Upanishads. And he quotes them in his teachings. Because after all, in that day and age, the teachings of the Upanishads were common conversation among the upper classes who were trained in it. So if you don't study Buddha and Upanishads, you would never know this. <laughs> but I was very fortunate. My mentor, Nyanananda Bhikkhu, uh, had done that. He had studied both. And this led to a series of amazing insights, which so much alarmed the other <laughs> Buddhists that he was shadow banned for life. But that's another story. The point is that the sutras, the Buddha suttas, the Vedas, and the sutras of yoga, Patanjali's sutras, align perfectly on the subject of the ultimate state. And what is it? Chitta vritti nirodaha. <laughs> Completely stopping the modifications of the mind, restoring it to its original state. So now we need to talk about its original state. One of the meanings of chitta is consciousness. So what about consciousness? Well, there are two kinds of consciousness. Svarup means the original, unmodified, pure, objectless awareness, or turiya. And then there's rupasampanna, conditioned, modified consciousness, and its objects. So if we look at the consciousness diagram, we see that only turiya, is unmodified. The other three, Sushupti, Svapna, and Jagrat, are conditioned or modified by, guess what? Upadis. So then let's look into this some more. How is the Chit Svarupa modified? How is the original consciousness or the original form of the mind, how is it modified? How is it changed? The answer is by adhyasa, superimposition of upadi, limiting adjuncts. Superimposition is when you have something, a platform, which is called the substrate. And then on top of this platform, you superimpose a different view. 
having very different qualities from the substrate. So the upadis are adhyasika. They are superimposed, projected, overlaid on the original consciousness, turiya. And because they are limiting adjuncts, they limit the input or the content of consciousness to only some narrow range. And this is called conditioning. Conditioned consciousness is unenlightenment, basically. So what are the different types of upadi? Tamasika means ignorance, sattvika, desire, and rajasika, or action. And those of you who know Vedic philosophy will recognize these immediately as the trigunya, the three modes of the material nature. So the point is they're all material and they're being superimposed on something that is not material. So this is a drastic difference in quality and it is the reason why we are suffering. Let's continue to take a look at this. Objectless Turiya consciousness is transcendental. But then when you add Upadis, Tamasika gives Sushupti consciousness, Sattvika gives Svapna, and Rajasika leads to Jagrat consciousness. So we are left with our good old chart. <laughs> that I have posted and displayed and shown and promoted and explained and <laughs> even advised people to download and, and make a quick reference card. Here, save a quick reference card of these four states of consciousness and related the seven states of the seven chakras. But I, I will link to that in the description below. Have fun with that. But the point is here that only Turiya is the pure, original, unmodified, transcendental consciousness. Why is that? Well, all the other three states of consciousness are modified by Upadis. And these Upadis are of three primary qualities. We went over that in the last video on the subtractive color theory as a metaphor for how the Upadis filter out things that do not pertain to them. But then when they combine together, oh man, all kinds of weird, different <laughs> conceptions, or I should say misconceptions, flow forth from these Upadis combining in different ways, and they lead to these lower states of consciousness. This is exactly how it happens which I don't think anybody has ever discussed openly. This is something that you realize, I think, only when you practice it. So when we talk about the eternal sunshine of the unmodified mind, we're finally getting around to the subject, right? <laughs> Only made you wait 20 minutes. But I had to say all that to lead up to this. The eternal sunshine of the unmodified mind is an experience. Now, don't think about the film of a similar name. <laughs> but it's interesting that the treatment that they got in the film was erasing memories. See, so in other words, removing modifications of the mind. So similarly in yoga, huh? Chitta vritti nirodha means removing all these upadis that filter out the sunshine of Brahman. Now this is a practice. When, when he says chitta vritti nirodaha, he's telling you to sit down and do it. So anybody who's studied yoga for more than a few weeks can sit nicely 
sit properly, and then they can practice the higher levels. Withdrawal of the mind from the senses, concentration on a certain subject, meditation on it, and finally, samadhi. What is samadhi? Samadhi is turiya. Samadhi is nibbana or nirvana. The complete cessation of all fabrications and the complete relinquishment of all limiting adjuncts, upadis. Huh? Buddha said so. <laughs> Relinquish your upadis. Buddha said so. So when you actually practice this, you get a certain taste. And let me see if I can describe it. Imagine going to the beach early in the morning on a beautiful, clear, warm, tropical day. Not a cloud in the sky. Huh? Perfect temperature, both the air and the water. The only sounds are the wind, the waves, maybe some seagulls. So you're lying on the warm sand at the beach, like looking up at this perfectly cloudless sky, saturated with sunlight. You don't see the sun itself because the sun is still close to the horizon. It's like over your head if you're lying down on the beach. But you can see the sky full of beautiful, glowing, effulgent sunshine. You don't necessarily see the source. And then there's this whole mood of peace, unchanging clarity, purity, perfection. So this is the mood. This is what you're trying to attain. You're trying to attain this cloudless sky of a mind unmodified, by the application of upadis. So this is something everyone can directly realize. It is not something you have to go off to a cave somewhere, you know, I mean, maybe that helps. But people today aren't austere. You know, the most austere cave is their bedroom, maybe. <laughs> so that's my cave. And I go in and practice this during the silent hours of the early morning. Like this morning, I got up around 1.30. And absolute silence, beautiful. So I lit a candle in front of the Shiva Lingam and did my practice. And what's my practice? I use a mantra, Om Namah Shivaya. But you can use any mantra that you have faith in. And I follow this mantra into the sandhi, the junction, in between waking and sleeping, in between jagrat and svapna consciousness. And then I play with it. I have found that the thoughts and dreams that pop up in the mind when it's unengaged stop when you go to sleep and then wake up. So you know how when you're meditating, it's easy to fall asleep, right? So people struggle against it. Don't struggle against it. Let it happen. But you're sitting. Your spine is vertical. You're going to wake up again soon. It's just as my Adi Guru would call it, it's just a snap. A quick little nap, 30 seconds or a minute maybe. And then you wake up again. And when you come out of that snap, the mind is clear. It's bright. It's illuminated from within. Not by the light of the sun or moon through the senses not by electricity or, you know, any other means of illumination. It is itself self-effulgent. That is its unmodified state. 
So when we talk about the clear, faultless sky glowing with the light of the sun in a perfectly peaceful atmosphere, nothing going on, nothing happening at all. See, this is the state. This is Nibbana. This is Samadhi. This is Turiya. Then from this point of view, you can easily see how any thought that comes up, no matter what its nature, is going to obscure that. It's going to be like a cloud in that sky that comes and covers the sun. Diminishing its illumination. Huh? A limiting adjunct to the sun. So <laughs> I'm getting really into the mood now. I'm going to have to go sit down and just enjoy this uh, beautiful state, samadhi, for a while yet before breakfast. <laughs> because this is it. It don't get no better on planet Earth than samadhi, <laughs> nibbana, nirvana, turiya. Huh? These are all names for the same thing. And it's a state where there is no suffering. Well, and also no identity, uh, no body, no senses, no thoughts, no ideas, no ego. And for this reason, people today feel a strong antipathy to samadhi. I mean, even the beginning of samadhi, pratyahara, is just so unpopular that it's never taught. If the students would demand it, okay, we've been studying yama, niyama, and asana, and pranayama now for, I don't know, X number of years. What about the next step? But nobody ever asks that question. No one has ever asked me, that's for sure. <laughs> And I don't know any yoga teacher who has ever gotten this question. And I've asked them. It just doesn't come up. Even though they claim to be teaching Ashtanga yoga, huh? they're really teaching at most like Trishanga. <laughs> Three limbs. What are they? Maybe Yama, Asana, and a little Pranayama. Niyama, oh, forget it. Niyama means what not to do. Well, nobody wants to hear about that these days either. But that doesn't mean it's unnecessary. It's absolutely necessary. And that, if you go and check that link to the Vedanta Sutra, the first sutra, and its interpretation and commentary by Shankaracharya, basically what he says is that to get this, you have to be a sannyasi. To actually attain this state. Because otherwise, well, think about it, you know. If you're like a typical person that I meet every day here in Sri Lanka, you're married, you have kids, you ha have a house or own a house, you have a vehicle, you have so many things and stuff and a job, and like, Maybe you're going to school or, you know, all these activities. So while you're sitting, all these things are going to come up in your mind. It's going to be like the constantly churning waves of the ocean. It won't let you attain samadhi. You have to, like, go into solitude. Why did the Buddha say so many times... If you read the Buddha suttas, uh, when somebody had attained knowledge of his teaching, he would say, and, and it's quoted, the same quote again and again in the Buddha suttas, go alone to the roots of a tree, to the bank of a river, to a mountain, to a forest, to an abandoned house, or even a field a big pasture or something like that, where nobody's around, 
You can sit in the shade of a tree. Nobody's going to disturb you. Nobody's even going to come there. <laughs> and do what has to be done. What is that? Etang santang etang panitang yadidang sabba sankhara samato sabhu padi pati nisago tang hakayo virago nirodo nibbanam.